One was a little bitty baby, two was a Joseph and Mary, three was the three little children, four was the four that stood at the door. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> Well, I think, I think we will get you started, if that's okay. Um, but yeah, so um, thanks to everyone for coming. I'm Andy Battaglia. I'm an editor with Art News and Art in America, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Mike Henderson. Um, we're gonna, what you just saw was a, a, an excerpt from a documentary in the works, um, which I know uh, seeing more of that will be... Uh, exciting when it when it happens. Um, we're going to talk for a little bit and then um, we're going to be graced with uh, three or so songs um, at the end. So um, yeah, there's a lot to touch on. So I, I wanted to start um, in the in the film excerpt that we saw, you, you described um, coming to San Francisco in 1965 mm -hmm. to go to the Art Institute. Um, and I'm I wonder I mean, how, how did this San Francisco feel to you coming from Missouri and Il Illinois, outside of the school context and out of the art scene? Like, what, what are just your sort of early, uh, earliest memories of, or impressions of the city's overall? The diversity. Walking through Chinatown, walking through North Beach, hearing it. Uh, different languages speak spoken, and going to the Mission District, hearing Spanish being t talked, so all that was exciting to me. And seeing different nationalities on the street, that was that was uh, that was exciting right from the get. You know, even before I got to the school, <laughs> you know, I was walking to the school, was just like was blown away by all the different people I saw and the different cultures and so forth and, and just seeing how people, uh, you know, this was going on and I'd been stuck in uh, a black and white world, you know, and I was, I was, I was just, I was ready for it. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, as we saw in, in the, the film, I mean, you've worked in a, a variety of different styles over the decades. Um, and I'd like to talk about a few sh shifts in those styles, okay. but um, I, mean, I guess starting at the, at the beginning, um, your earliest paintings in San Francisco, the, the protest paintings um, that are so visceral and disturbing and raw, I'm, I'm curious, like, I mean, how, how did you first arrive upon that style and then how, how did it develop just in the first few years you were here? Well, uh seeing people speak out about issues that, uh, that uh, I felt uh, I couldn't talk about in Missouri. And wondering, that's like I said again, when I went through this whole period of coming out here thinking I wanted to be a portrait painter and, uh, and trying to paint models and so forth, it just, it wasn't nothing coming from the gut, you know what I mean? And, um, then I remember doing that first protest painting, and uh, it just seemed like something started. I, I felt something, you know, and all of a sudden I started feeling what I thought some of my heroes that I looked at, they were, felt when they, uh, they got on a row or something, they were speaking about stuff, you know, and saying, especially, like I said, again, Van Gogh was my... I, was my uh, hero when I saw that show in Kansas City, especially the potato eaters and, and the hunger and the, the labor that was going on, you know, and um, uh, just just the lifestyles, you know, and that's how I grew up. And I wanted to, um, when I felt like I was speaking about something that was uh, that I had been involved with, the the um, the figures had more meaning, the colors had more meaning. You know, the, the need to make a hand look like a hand was, was there, you know. I didn't like figure drawing classes, you know. When, when I needed to draw a hand was because I needed to draw one, not because I wanted to learn how the anatomy and all that academic part of it. I just felt that painting was becoming like a, like a voice or something in me and it, and as it changed, um, and it showed me the next step I should be taking. So 
each step from the figurative work to, uh, I think when I got the camera, when I got to the camera, that's when the figures left because I felt like movement is what I want because I went to this uh, rally when Dr. King was killed in the Civic Center and I was on my way back to school to work on my painting and when I got in front of the painting, I wanted the figures to move and they didn't <laughs> and I thought about um, filmmaking which uh, there was filmmaking going on at school, but I never felt it was something that I, uh, um, that in bothered, it intrigued me in some way that I never thought I would do until I came back from that march. And I realized that's the way to make a figure move. There was more power to move people or to say something with a figure that moved rather than one that was just painted like a photograph, you know? Yeah. Um, you well, you're, you're moving a little, fa little too fast. So let's. Um, I'm curious. Like when, when you, you talked about sort of developing a, your voice at the very beginning mm -hmm. with with the protest paintings. Mm -hmm. um, I I mean, what was what was the reaction like? Like how much were you encouraged or discouraged or um, like when you were first finding that voice? What, like, what are your memories of? I was. Uh, I didn't listen to anybody. <laughs> Good advice, you know, always. <laughs> yeah. I was always hard-headed, but uh, I guess. But uh, but I just, I, to me, the painting was working. I didn't really give a damn what anybody thought, because I felt like, uh, I, you know, it's, it's like when you when you taste something you like, you're going to eat it regardless of what people think. You know, if it's got too much salt in it, doesn't matter, <laughs> or whatever. Too much sugar. If you like it, you're going to eat it. So. I was, I felt I was getting something from it. And that seemed to be something that was also encouraged around the Art Institute too. So nobody said anything. So I just kept doing it, you know? I mean, uh, people would say, well, you should do this or you should, you, should, uh, you should take the monsters out and just have the people or you should spend more time with the people and look at, and, but I, it wasn't what I was interested in because, uh, you know, I've seen um, uh, uh, De Kooning's figurative paintings and so forth. So I knew a figure didn't have to be, look like a photograph to be a figure, you know? And, and what the eye, well, I, I had this great uh, uh, art history teacher, Fred Martin at the Art Institute. And I, I set up for the lectures. I was the person that cleaned up and set up the projectors and everything. So I loved the lectures. You know, to me it was like, it was like that was the real class. I learned more from that, him talking about how artists get from this point to that point and all the journeys they go through. So I felt, I was feeling that within myself and I knew that, that, um, that it was, that it was something was internal. It wasn't something that everybody would feel that I, that I would talk. I couldn't put it in words, you know. It was just something you felt deeply about and, you know, and come high, high water, you're going you're gonna to see it through, you know. And uh, that, was, that was what uh, the way the, the criticism went, you know. So I knew people were always going to say something, but, you know, it was me that was in the water to sink or swim, so I was gonna make sure that if, if I did it wrong, then I'll know how to do it next time. I'll listen next time, <laughs> you know, or whatever. You yeah. Know? Um, and so, I mean, two early paintings of yours uh, showed in, in two uh, important exhibitions at the Whitney Museum in New York, um, in, in shows called uh, Human Concern Personal Torment, The Grotesque in American Art in 1969, mm -hmm. and then Contemporary Black Artists in America in 1971. Um, what was that like for you? You were quite young at the time. Oh, I thought, <laughs> it is, the ship has finally arrived <laughs> until they sent the painting back. <laughs> The crate was so big, I, I, I made a bed out of it. <laughs> made a bed out I of it? I made a bed out of it, because, you know, and so forth. But I thought that uh, it was going to be the beginning of something, especially the human, because all of my heroes were in that show, you know? And, and I, I liked the work that was in it. Plus, I liked that it was 
human concern and personal torment, you know. And uh, so I was very excited, you know, but um, I didn't go to the opening or anything like that. But, um, but anyway, knowing that the painting was there was, was very, was very uh, I guess you'd say, um, in, uh, encouraging for me, you know? Yeah. How, how much, I mean, San Francisco was so rich and fertile at the time. How much were you, like how much or little were you looking at what other people were doing in LA or New York or other places at that time? It was also much harder to I didn't get a look, sense I of didn't look any further than my canvas. That's the only thing that I could do anything about. The rest would be just opinions about, oh, it's this way or that way, you know? And was, so I didn't really pay that much attention really to any of that stuff really until I started uh, teaching at Davis when I found the need to talk to people who worked in different venues and so forth and having a conversation with it. Then you learn how to see what they're seeing and doing what they're, do what they're doing, you know, and so forth. But there was nothing I could say to them. It's, it's, it's usually in them or it's not. You can't teach art. You know, it's either in you, it's a calling, you know. And, uh, and when you can tell when somebody's driven, you know. Um, I never was a teacher. I always felt like a coach, you know. Nobody can teach you to run fast or how to be bigger or any of that stuff. And I always felt like in art, it's, it's in you or it isn't, you know? And I think um, like any occupation, anything that you choose to do, if you fail at it, then you know what the next step is gonna be. So I would always encourage people to keep doing what they're doing and you'll find your way, you know? It may not be art, but maybe uh, your kids will be artists or maybe you'll be a collector or run a gallery or something. Uh, you, you'll learn to be a better person because you'll realize there's more than one way to s see something or do something, you know? So it all, it's all, it all fits. Whatever way you start off on the journey, it doesn't matter, you know? It's like what you learn on it and what your life takes you through. That's the richest part for me was. Yeah, I, I like that idea of an art coach. Um, uh, and so you, so your your early protest paintings, you, um, you you already mentioned you picked up the camera in part because you wanted to mm -hmm. make the figures move, um, which they did, um, in lots of various different ways. Um, and then, and then you also started working in a much different style um, after that um, of the kind that were that is on view uh, behind us, um, and is a. Uh, which is a painting titled Rain from 1977. Mm -hmm. um, and works from this period, um, from 1976 to 1980, are currently on view at Haynes Gallery, just mm -hmm. a short uh, walk away uh, from here. Um, and I I've, I've read you refer to, to works in, in this mode as, as space modules, um, in, in part. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm curious, like, what, um, this obviously looks very different than a painting like The Scream. Um, so what prompted the shift, uh, was, both into, was, to this style in particular and then ab abstraction in general? The painting, the, the painting just took me there. You know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a conscious decision. You wake up one morning and you say, I can't, I can't do another one of those. Other, if, I, if I do, I'm repeating myself. I'm, 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 I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. And I was, I was on a, um, my sort of a search for who Mike Henderson was, you know? And uh, it, so that was, my, that, was, that was the thing that drove me to, uh, to be able to change. Plus, I'm a Gemini. <laughs> and, and, and I see more than one way all the time, you know, which got me in trouble a lot in my life, you know, and I began... That was the great thing about coming to California because, uh, because um, I began to meet other people who were doing more than one thing. And, and I, I, saw, I saw how work can change and how some people were laboring to stay in one place like they gotta define themselves as a shape or, 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 or 
or a style or something. I wasn't interested in that. I was more interested in what was it that I could say? What more could I say? What more could I find out, you know? I felt, I guess I, when I go in the studio, I feel more like a scientist trying to explore, you know, trying to experiment it and find out what, you know, reaching for something, I don't know what it is, but I just keep reaching for that, 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 you know, and so forth, that whatever that is. And that was one great thing at Davis because I ran into, uh, uh, when I ran into Bob Nelson, he introduced me to Bill Wiley and, and, that, and among those guys who were living and worked together, like him and Hudson and Bill Allen, they seem to have this. Uh, they seem to have this sort of uh, uh, how would you say um, a search for the unknown. You know, willing to experiment, not not afraid to fail. And I just it just it just clicked with me. You know. Even when I even, I even found it in Tebow, you know, you might not think that from his work, but deep down in with conversations with him, he, that was part of his search too, you know. And you realize that that uh, people find what they can do and how they do it, and it just comes to them, you know. And some people find it right away. Some people go through a lot of changes. And, and just accepting that, you know, that I wasn't a person that was going to, uh, it came to me that way. I had to, I had to go through these prerequisites or something, you know, one thing, I was like unfolding something, unfolding for me was like unfolding. Yeah. And I was, you know, um, when, when like the rain, this painting was uh, also, uh, done because um, when I when I graduated, all of a sudden I was living in a flat. I couldn't afford a studio. I got a studio when I graduated. It was so big I couldn't work in it. It was just too big for me. So I I, I, I moved into a flat and said, well I have to start here. And I worked small and you know and I was searching for. Plus, being around all those guys who had seemed to found themselves, I wanted to find out who I was. So I felt like uh, there was more to me than what I'd been taught. It was to like, okay, find yourself, forget everything you've been taught, and go against the grain. Yeah. And I look, look, burn looking it. back, like at a work like this now, like I mean. How would you describe what you think you were trying to express with this style that, I think that, I was that you weren't able to I think I was coming to together with, uh, with uh, how film had affected me, you know, because these pieces are, are, are cut up and glued together, like edited and so forth, like you would like edit film and so forth, like making sculpture. Sculpture was something that was hard for me. That's why I said in the earlier I was looking for Bob Hudson so I could find out we had to write a paper and I didn't understand sculpture, never understand three-dimensional objects. And uh, I wanted to get a passing grade and I uh, ran into Bob Nelson. <laughs> but, I, uh, but, but that was my introduction to making sculpture and, and, and filmmaking came into that. So all of these things that I learned become part of the painting because all of a sudden, I couldn't do oil painting in the place I was living in because there's people living in the building too. So I, when I switched to acrylic, and I had to find another way and find out how acrylics were going to work for me because acrylic was was a medium you couldn't mix like I could mix oil. You know, I could I felt like I could invent colors with oil, which I eventually got back to once I got to the point where. Uh, I felt like I earned the right to uh, have a studio big enough and could afford it and uh, so forth. But uh, these early paintings uh, all were like uh, from like searching, like I say again, searching for the, for, for, I don't know if I was searching for an end, but I was, uh, I was searching to f try to find out what was my voice, what was my voice, you know. If you were out around Roy Forrest, <laughs> everything was a dog. 
you were either a cocker spaniel or a poodle. <laughs> he prayed to the great dingle in the sky when he wanted a parking spot. You could not go to lunch with Tebow without having dessert. You had to have ice cream, you had to have cake. Mike, aren't you gonna have some dessert here? Yes, you know. You know, Arneson the same way, Manuel with his figures, Wiley with, uh, you know, him and everything he did, you know, it was like I say again, it was like this, this, it was just this incredible place to, uh, to be mentored from, you know, and I, uh, I talked to all those guys a lot about how did they find their way, you know. And I remember, I remember Roy just loving dogs, you know, the other day, you know. And um, I guess I could say Arneson must have thought he was the best looking guy in the world because he kind of making his face all the time, you know. And, you know, and everybody knows what Manuel loved because that's what he made, you know. And, uh, you know, Wiley, you know, he was, you know, he was all over the map, you know, and so was I. And so I had something in common. I could find, I, there was a common ground and it was like, okay, you're okay now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Jump in the deep water, join us. Find yourself, you know, find my voice. And that's something I wanted to do. I wanted to distinguish myself the way these guys who did them distinguish themselves because there's a part of you as an artist that comes up and says, I wanna be, I wanna be, I wanna be that person. Yeah. You know, whether it's in my lifetime or not in my lifetime didn't matter. Because I felt like I was I was never gonna get married, never have a family or anything like that. I wanted to I wanted to be free to to search for Mike Henderson, you know. Right. Um, and we saw so we saw mention of your love of music in, in the film, and there's evidence of it here. <laughs> um, and so the, you obviously have a background in the blues, um, but your interests also range far and wide into people like Sun Ra and Rashawn, Roland Kirk. Um, and I guess I'm curious how much, um, I mean, how do you think your sort of mu mind for music has figured into your painting or your work as an artist overall? I never, I never, never had a conversation with myself. I'm one of those, as my grandmother used to say, just load the wagon, don't worry about the mule is blind. So I never sort of looked and said, well, why am I doing this or this have music or whatever. Thinking takes up too much time, you know, you know. It just takes up too much time, you know. And I, um, I, just, I, I just like doing stuff, you know. Like I said, again, I'll, I'll see what happens. I'm either going to sink or swim, you know. There isn't going to be any treading water here, you know. So it was like, uh, I never really paid any attention. People who think about that never do that, you know, because, you know, when I, when I worked in Marshall, I used to clean up the building for the Alcoholic Anonymous, and they had a big sign over the, over the when you walked in the, in the room, and it said, thinking leads to drinking. <laughs> so, <laughs> I used to tell my students all of that, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Drinking. Yeah, that boils, boils an awful lot down. Uh, uh, and then, so in 1985, there was a, a fire in your studio that counted yes, as an unfortunate yes, that catalytic was, uh, event. That was the thing that challenged the old dog here, <laughs> that's for damn sure. Because my, my work was going to stand for my existence as, a, you know, being alive and whatever, you know. Then when they told me it was all gone, it was just like, okay, what are you going to do now, Mike? And I said, well, I guess I'd do it all over again. And I thought there was more opportunities for me in Europe because that's it was it was there. But somehow thought of being burned out in the states and forced to stay there. I said, hell no, I'm gonna go back to the states and and if things don't click I'll come back but I'm not going to be burned out and stay over here because I met Americans over there who left 
and all, the, all, all their questions were, well, what's going on in the States? And I said, if I, if I have to stay in Europe for a better life, then I'm never going to ask what's going on in the States. It didn't make any sense. So I came back, and next thing I know, um, Diana Fuller introduced me to Cheryl, and my life just began to begin to put the pieces together and so forth, and one step after another, and now it's been 15 sh years of shows with her, you know, so yeah. it's just, you know, one step in front of the other, you know. No expectations was my motto when I came back to the States. I said, no expectations, you know. Right. Um, and I mean, you said you said everything was lost in, in the fire, but not but not not quite no everything. no. Once um, I got back, once the, once I got back, but that initial shock of right. telling me the thing that I uh, that I cherished the most was um, I had a student who, uh, who uh, there was a student who took film classes, and he got a job working for a film crew. So when Mother Teresa came, got the Nobel Peace Prize. She came to the city to talk to the diocese. And he's real tall, so she was blessing medals and giving it to him. So she looked at him and said, you're really tall. You just have lots of sin. <laughs> so she gave him a handful of medals, and she, he gave me one of them. So when I was leaving to go the next morning, I was wondering where to put that. And I stuck it next to the his blues films that I had been working on. Because I'd shot 15 hours of blues footage stuff and I wanted to finish this project. So that was the most precious thing. Because a lot of the people had died, like Big Mama Thornton and so forth, and all of those, you know, and so forth. Anyway, the fire stopped at that door. When I came back and I found that the, uh, that the, um, there were there were traces of stuff. Wiley called me and told me that he was going to get some people together and they were going to take out what was salvageable and so forth. And yeah. when I got back, so I stayed and finished out the tour because it took. I was there for three months, and then then um, why I was before I left to go to Europe, I said when I get back, I was planning on going back to oil because I felt that acrylic had ran its course and I needed to find my original instrument, like the guitar is to me, the way oil was, was my voice. So they were, had these studios out in Hunter's Point, so I went out there to see what it would take to get one of those so I could start working in oil again. And then, you know, found the place in Peter Vocalist's building. Uh, Wanda Hansen found it for me. and. Uh, I moved there, and next thing you know, I was married. <laughs> That's yeah. done, and bought a house and uh, built a studio in the backyard. Thanks to Cheryl. <laughs> right. um, and so, and you have a, a survey show opening in about a week uh, at the Minetti Shrum Museum at UC mm -hmm. Davis, mm -hmm. um, titled "Before the Fire: 1965 mm -hmm. to 1985," um, and some of the works. For in the exhibition were, were restored, and what, what was what did that entail? What was that process like for the ones that that were salvageable? The, you have to talk to Cheryl about that. I was blessed enough to have it all taken care of. I didn't have to think about it and just keep working and so forth. And they just came over and pulled everything out. Of it. Thanks to Dan Nadell, <laughs> yeah. he came over looking for a painting for. A uh, landscape show and he asked me what was in the sheds and I told him there was paintings and he said can he peek in I said well you know uh, I don't sure what the hell then he's and he started rummaging through and he came out and he said uh, I didn't know what he's gonna say but I wasn't expecting what he said he says I want to show this stuff and I said you're kidding he says no I'm serious I want to show it and I said okay and that's that's when the ball started rolling, and yeah. I didn't have to do really um, anything. I should mention too that the, there's a very nice monograph uh, accompanying the exhibition, and Dan Adele has an essay in it that's very good. Um, and I, last question: I mean, it's hard not to want to sit up here and talk to you all all night, um, but uh, what, with an eye on the clock, I'm just I'm curious. I mean, 
how it's felt to have received the recognition you have in the past few years. I mean, you, you, were, you were in Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power, which is a major exhibition that came here uh, in 2019. Uh, you had a show at the Art Institute the same year. Um, there was a screening of your films two days ago at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in LA. Uh, there's the Meneni Shrem show, there's the, the Haynes Gallery show that we talked about. Um, so how has it felt to like at I'm this wondering point? what the hell is gonna happen in February. <laughs> you know. You know, you know. Old country boy get used to this, <laughs> you know. So uh, I'm 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 ready for Freddie and uh you know, um, I guess I'll have to clean up my studio and clean out the gutters and <laughs> go back to that type of stuff. But it's been, it's been great. It's been great. I know it all the time it's not me, it's the work. So I appreciate that, that the work is getting shown. And, and uh, like I said again, I didn't really care if it happened in my lifetime or after my lifetime. The whole thing is I wanted to leave a mark, you know, that I'd really existed in the space and time, and I wanted it to be relevant to someone, you know. Even if someone says, well, that's something I don't want to do, <laughs> they find their way, whatever, you know. I just wanted to be that, you know. <clears throat> uh, I, I just, you know, because like I say again, I've taken so much from others, you know, all of the I never met, I remember as a kid looking at Norman Rockwell's paintings and comic books, wondering how they made Batman look up or looking down to the perspective, how that was done and so forth. And uh, that was all intriguing to me. And I just, like I said again, I didn't want to, I didn't want to take any more than I've given, you know, and I wanted to make sure I gave back to whatever it, it was to uh, to pay my debt, you know, because I feel, I feel like you, I feel like you, as an artist, we all owe something to the generation before because it took a lot of brave m women and men to say that art should be a part of culture, you know, and so forth. And, and when you travel, you can see how the other cultures, how it fits into other cultures and so forth. So... I just wanted to be a part of that, you know. Yeah, and you certainly have given a lot, and uh, here's looking forward to February. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> I think, um, is there anything you want to say b about the music that you're going to play and who you're going to play it with? Uh, well, I'm going to play with Mr. John Rodstead here on bass, and Mr. John Otis. If he doesn't show, I'm going to find him 50. <laughs> there he is. There he is. <laughs> and so forth and our band is called Cabin Fever and uh, we agreed to be a trio and um, we're about to uh, write some original songs and the three songs I'm gonna play are some of the first songs I ever wrote which was another something we could talk about another time we get some beer. <laughs> let's, let's make a plan for that for yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, yeah, if you guys wanna come up and um, but yeah, thanks to everyone. Thank you. A one, a two, a one, two, three. Love is sweet as the wine I've been drinking. Love is sweeter than any honey you'll ever taste. Love's like barbecue sauce, it'll be sent to waste. Love is sweet, love is sweet, love is sweeter than any honey you'll ever taste. Love is sweet, sweeter than anything you'll ever know. Coffee, you can have it still a coffee, you can have it.
love is still a tease. Give me some of you, girl, now. Give me some of me, love is sweet. Fifty fifty is a recipe. Love is better than song, alone. Sweet as it can be. on the table I'll shoot a nickel or a dime Throw the dice on the table I'll shoot a nickel or a dime Yes, I'm back on my feet After a real tough time Had a drop out of sight about six months ago Had a funky running Nice and fat, I know they sleep in my bed, eating my food. But 
I got somebody else outside. Before I bring her in, I want to tell you all this. I want you to listen good. Party's over. Stack up the cards and go home. Cause gamblers don't gamble. Women you're trying to get to Nine out of ten, I'm the one to let them go Get off of me, woman Go cost you twenty dollars to send a postcard where I'm going <laughs> Thank you That was when I rode out to the fire Here's one I wrote. Uh, a good song comes like a painting, it just comes out of you. Once I was overseas. Had a lot of bad luck coming to my life about then. Thought I was riding high. When I looked up, I was looking up and down. And I found someone to help me change my life around. Get my feet back on the ground. This is for her. Thank God I can say. No more lonely nights. And everything is all right.
John Otis on drums, this is John Rockstead on bass. Thank you very much. So we're going to be over at the uh, Haynes Gallery a little bit later, so come on over and uh, have a drink of wine and <laughs> listen to a little bit of blues music. Thank you very much.